anything, Brendan? Should I be looking at Paul's slide on the YouTube? Yes. Can somebody on the YouTube? Uh, it's come up. It's come up, it's come up, up on, on YouTube. YouTube. I, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Grand. Okay. 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 Well, in that case, uh, welcome everybody to the IGRM 2021. Uh, I'm Brendan McGowan of Mary Mackle College Limerick, the organizers. I'm sorry that we can't welcome you all to Limerick in person. <coughs> glad that we are able to host an IGRM this year. Uh, I just want to briefly introduce my co-chair for this evening's event, uh, John Murray of NUI Galway. John, would you like to say hello? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry for the for slight delay, delay, but we're, we're all really, really excited, excited for this, for this um, uh, lecture. lecture. It's, 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 it's going, going to be really, really interesting. interesting. Um, um, just, just to say, to say my, job my job this evening, evening is really somehow to try and manage, manage the chat. The chat. Um, so, um, so please, please by, by all, all means, means uh, any, any questions, questions or comments or feedback, put them into the chat, either if you're here on Microsoft Teams, or I'm looking at the chat here on the YouTube channel, channel as, well. as well. So we'll, so we'll, we'll take, take questions, questions and all at the very end, end um, um, and, and you can either ask them if you, them want, if you want to put your hand up on Teams or type, or type them into the chat, chat on YouTube, YouTube and, and we'll make sure we, we get around, around to everybody's questions. questions. So, so yeah. yeah, thanks very, thanks much, very much everybody, everybody for, for uh, um, uh, uh, attending. attending. Brendan. Okay. Brendan. Thanks very much, John. Okay, so on to the main event. So tonight's guest was my number one choice. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, sorry, I got muted there. Uh, tonight's guest was my number one choice uh, for keynote speaker from as soon as I was thinking about uh, organizing the IGRM. He is one of the most influential geologists of our lifetime uh, with a huge body of work on tectonics of the Proterozoic. Uh, including some really great paper titles such as United Plates of America uh, and uh, of course is responsible uh, for the Snowball Earth uh, model for the late Neoproterozoic. Uh, can you please all give a big welcome to Professor Paul Hoffman. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so uh, good, evening, good evening or good morning, or good morning as it is here. Is here. I hope, I hope everyone, everyone is, is uh, feeling, feeling in an ecumenical, an ecumenical mood, mood because, because uh, 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 my, my goal, goal this evening is to uh, attempt to reconcile uh, two conflicting views, um, one from molecular phylogenomics and the other from paleontology and geology. And uh, briefly, um, phylogenomics, looking at um, at uh, gene sequences in, uh, or DNA sequences in modern organisms and how they correlate with uh, habitat in what's uh, known variably as uh, trait habitat evolution or ancestral state reconstruction, uh, are putting forward the view that most marine primary producers evolved through most of their evolutionary history in fresh water. And, uh, and only recently, in uh, late Neoproterozoic and Phanerozoic time, did they radiate into marine environments. And this seems to be completely at odds with the fossil record, which shows that uh, cyanobacteria go back in marine environments uh, at least two billion years ago. And um, among algae, uh, including multicellular algae, uh, there's a clear fossil record in marine environments back beyond one billion years ago. And so uh, what I hope to do tonight is to reconcile uh, these two con seemingly conflicting views, which I think, in fact, are both correct and can be reconciled if we consider the implications of this. And uh, this, of course, is the snowball earth. And uh, this climate state uh, which I can define as a, a climate in which the oceans are covered by a continuous ice shelf. And by an ice shelf, I mean a layer of ice that's hundreds of meters thick and therefore 
flows under the under its own weight, under the influence of gravity, and so it tends to flow in and and close off any uh, any open water area. And obviously, being so thick, it makes the ocean totally dark. So there's no prospect of doing photosynthesis under this ice shelf. And uh, at the same time, in this climate state, uh, the continents are mostly, but not entirely, buried by ice sheets. And those ice sheets are are maintained uh, in a dynamic, steady state by uh, by sublimation off the uh, ablation zone of this tropical ice shelf or sea glacier, as it's called. And um, this climate state um, existed during two stages between 717 and 635 million years ago. There was a brief non-glacial interval towards the end of it. But in total, uh, this climate state persisted for somewhere between 60 and 72 million years, which is longer than the, than the entire uh, Cenozoic. So uh, you should be interested in this because um, the Port of Skeg formation is extensively exposed in uh, Donegal, and although there hasn't been much work on it recently, um, it did contribute in its time um, to the assembly of, of geological data on, uh, on this phenomenon. And uh, unfortunately, I've never visited Ireland, so my photograph here is from Scotland, uh, just along uh, the, the uh, tectonic strike. Now, how did I get into this? Uh, I, a few years ago now, I was uh, coming back from my field area here in uh, southwestern Africa in Namibia, and I came via London because I wanted to attend this meeting. And as I often do uh, under such conditions, I set up a little uh, lecture tour um, to promote the snowball Earth as a legitimate scientific hypothesis back in <laughs> eight years ago uh, when that was still required. And um, and uh, one of the stops in, in his tour was at the University of Bristol. And uh, after my talk, um, Patricia Sanchez Bercaldo came up to me and introduced herself as a as a molecular phylogenomicist specializing in modern marine cyanobacteria. And she said that she had some interesting new results and uh, she'd like them to discuss them with me if I had time uh, the next morning before I caught the train. So <laughs> overnight, I was thinking about, uh, you know, what little do I know about molecular phylogenomics? And I remembered that uh, this business got started uh, back when I was an undergraduate, about 60 years ago, um, uh, with the um, proposal uh, by a French biologist named uh, Emile Zuckerkandl, um, who went to the U.S. to work with a famous American physical chemist, Linus Pauling. And Zuckerkandl originally wanted to study um, copper oxidase, which seemed to control the timing of molting in crabs. But Linus Pauling said, well, you know, you're going to have to start from scratch working out the structure of this copper oxidase. Why don't you work on hemoglobin? Because we've already worked out the structure of it. And um, there's this new technique where, you where you know, we, we have the ability now to, um, uh, and this was in the very early days now, of sequencing the, uh, uh, the DNA, the nucleic acids in, in this hemoglobin. And so why don't you look at the differences in these sequences between different primates like chimps and gorillas and orangutan on a <clears throat> sort of simplifying assumption that uh, these differences in the, um, in, in the gene structure will have been built up by mutations. And if these mutation rates are, are broadly uniform between different uh, species and uh, constant when averaged over long periods of geologic time, of course, Lyot Pauling knew that uh, mutation rates weren't completely constant. He was himself very actively involved in trying to get nuclear weapons uh, no longer uh, tested in the atmosphere because of the uh, his his uh, you know well-founded concern for increased mutation rates. But he said if they're averaged over geologic time, um, then we can use the proportional differences in these sequences to get some idea of their phylogenetic relationships in geologic time. So for example, we can take the difference between chimp and gorilla, and if we know from fossil evidence what time their last common ancestor was, then we can you look at the proportional difference between these two and orangutan, for example, or humans, and, and then estimate uh, the last common ancestor of orangutan and, and, and chimp, for example. And by that way, we could build up 
a, 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 you know, a phylogenetic tree uh, in principle for all organisms under the Darwinian assumption of common descent. Okay, so that, you know, I'm trying to recollect now what I was thinking of before I went to see um, Patricia uh, Sanchez Bercaldo the next morning, which I did. And here's what she told me. So uh, to her surprise, uh, she found that major groups of modern marine planktonic cyanobacteria, which you would think would be very primitive, and that their last common ancestors of these groups would go back, you know, two billion years or more. Instead, she found that, in fact, most of these groups had last common ancestors, which were somewhere here in the Neoproterozoic. Okay, and these groups included the, you know, the Pico cyanobacteria, the, the synproclade, which is responsible for maybe 12% of uh, total organic productivity, and they're the dominant uh, primary producers in the gyres of the modern ocean. It also included uh, major groups of uh, nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria. And uh, she, at, the, at that time, and, and I think still to a degree, uh, took this to mean that before this time, the oceans, for some reason, uh, were not favorable uh, for primary production. Maybe because of the lack of nitrogen fixation due to anoxia, or because the oceans were euxinic and therefore there was uh, they were starved of metal nutrients, or there were several ideas were put forward about 20 years ago that might account for this. But most of these explanations geologists no longer accept. And then the second thing she she said uh, that morning, uh, though this didn't register quite so strongly with me at the time, was that most of these groups that radiated in marine environments in, in, in towards the end of the Neoproterozoic um, had last common ancestors that seemed to have had prior evolution in fresh water. Okay, and so that's depicted in this slide here. So here is this radiation into marine environments, and the blue bars are the ones that are in marine. And then many of these groups here, um, they seem to have come from ancestors, which shown here in green, which which had um, uh, which were in fresh water. Okay, so. Now here's a little bit more elaborate diagram. This is a few, uh, you know, a few years later now, and now we th this this idea that uh, early photosynthetic eukaryotes also not just cyanobacteria but also the early algae evolved primarily in fresh water and only radiated into marine environments relatively recently. So by early algae, I mean um, uh, what I call the Archaeplastida, which includes the glaucophyte algae, the, cro uh, the, um, the chlorophytes, and the streptophytes. And today the chlorophytes are predominantly marine. The streptophytes, which gave rise to all, all land plants, are predominantly fresh water. Now, what they do in this ancestral state or trait habitat evolution is they look for statistical correlations between the DNA or protein sequences and habitat, hot water, cold water, fresh water, marine, brackish, et cetera, et cetera. And then they map those correlations onto the phylogenetic trees. And um, in this diagram here, each one of these nodes is colored according to you know, the statistical likelihood of the habitat, in this case, freshwater, marine, or brackish, in which um, uh, the last common ancestors of, 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 the, of, these, uh, of these trees uh, were living. And as you can see here, here's the, the, the radiation into marine environments. But before about this time, is this what, you know, Patricia thought was a marine exclusion period, the time of, of important major evolution, long period of time probably, but which occurred, you know, all these orange dots occurred in fresh water. And only after this level here, this time here, did these forms radiate into marine environments. Okay. Well, <laughs> to paleontologists, this, this just doesn't seem credible. Because here, for example, are two photographs. This is a modern coccoid uh, cyanobacteria, uh, Entophysalis deuced, it's a major uh, benthic component, uh, a component of benthic mats in, in marine and uh, coastal marine environments today. This is the real, the dark fellow in, the, in Shark Bay on the stromatolites. And here are remarkably similar coccoid bacteria, over two billion years old from the Belcher group in eastern, each eastern Hudson Bay, uh, and now been dated accurately uh, by, uh, by Malcolm uh, Hodgkins' work uh, on the Belcher group who's now at Cambridge, incidentally. 
And, uh, and not only Cockloid, but Hans Hoffman back, uh, uh, back when uh, described a number of uh, cyanobacteria groups here, including filamentous forms, many of which are virtually indistinguishable uh, morphologically from modern cyanobacteria more than two billion years ago. And then if you consider um, uh, the eukaryotic primary producers, the eukaryotic algae, in this case, two uh, groups of multicellular uh, eukaryotic algae, both of these a little over a billion years in age. This is the famous Bangiomorpha uh, described by Nick Butterfield from the hunting group in Arctic Canada. This is purported to be a not only a multicellular red alga, but a crown group red alga, a bangiophyte, although that's been contested. And this one is a, is a multicellular green alga, um, once again, purported or you know believes uh, 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 good evidence that this is actually a highly derived uh, cladophoran. That's an ovophysian, which is a and believed to be a crown group. And in both of these cases, these are I think undoubtedly marine sequences. This is from the Nunfun Formation in northeastern Liaoning Peninsula, in northeast China. This is I mentioned Arctic Canada. So here, in a nutshell, is the problem. Here is the time when molecular phylogenomics and, and uh, uh, suggest that these uh, uh, primary producers radiated into the marine environment, but this is the fossil record from marine sequences. So there's clearly something wrong here. <laughs> okay, so enter Snowballer. So uh, in the top here is a diagram showing uh, the, the three basically distinct climate states of uh, the last 800 million years, and here extended back to uh, 3 billion years. And uh, the three climate states are the non-glacial state, which uh, we've been in most of the time, although not in today, and that's a state in which there are no large ice sheets anywhere. Uh, there may be sea ice at the poles, but no large ice sheets on any of the continents. Then there's the regional uh, glaciation, that's the state we're in now, where a small number of continents in, in, in the polar and subpolar regions have ice sheets. So we have two ice sheets today. We had four, have had four through most of the quaternary. And then here's the panglacial or snowball state. And uh, the last one was at the end of the cryogenian. This is the cryogenian here. And these are these two uh, uh, snowball earth states, the Sturdian, which lasted 56 million years, and the Marinoan, which lasted somewhere between six and 16 million years with a, a brief non-glacial interlude between them. Okay, so uh, a little bit about uh, the evidence for snowball earth. So first of all, the district has been known for decades now uh, that deposits of this age, this is sturdy and this is the Marinon, each of the yellow dots is a well-documented uh, 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 glacial or periglacial, in many cases glacial marine uh, succession. And as you can see, they're widespread on virtually every continent. And the areas where they do not occur are simply areas where you don't have rocks of the appropriate age. And so here's a reconstruction of the paleogeography at that time, the red stars of the glacial deposits. Um, the screws represent uh, the, the, the continents that have, uh, uh, that have robust paleomagnetic constraints. And as you can see, um, these glacial deposits are, uh, are, you know, include equatorial and low latitude deposits, which is also consistent with their occurrence in thick sequences of shallow water marine carbonates, which whether the global climate is hot or cold, Thick sequences of marine carbonates are always in, in, in relatively low latitudes in the warmest part of the surface uh, ocean because of the, of the saturation of, uh, of, of carbonate and its temperature and pressure sensitivity. So as it turns out, there's a very good theory to explain how this could happen. And this theory goes back to the very first climate models, simple one dimensional, that is pole to equator, uh, variation in temperature as a function of latitude, uh, assuming an energy balance. And, and still to this day in the most complex, multi-coupled, uh, uh, three-dimensional dynamic climate models, this instability or bifurcation is a robust feature of, of the Earth's climate. And basically it is because of the ice albedo feedback. So when the polar ice caps, and these have to be ice, not snow, because snow disappears in summer when, when the, most of the sunlight occurs in the Arctic. Remember, the Arctic Ocean receives more uh, sunlight per month in summer than the equator does at any time of the year. Is this because ice reflects most of the sunlight that falls on it, whereas water absorbs most of it. 
As these polar caps get bigger and bigger, there's an additional cooling effect just because of the increased reflectivity or albedo on the planetary scale. And there's a bifurcation or an instability that is a tipping point beyond which, or if you reach that point, then the advance of the ice is self-sustaining. And uh, the temperatures drop below freezing everywhere and you immediately go into this state here. So this is not stable. You can be here, you can be here, but you can't be in between. And this is known as the large ice cap instability. And um, although physicists, and the problem for climate dynamics was that it looked like it was the Earth could too easily lapse into the state. So the problem was how would you explain why it never happened? And, and they assumed it never happened because they didn't know there was any way of getting out. Of it. And so if it had happened, we, you know, you wouldn't be at this lecture tonight. But then uh, uh, Jim Walker, Paul Hayes, and uh, Jim Casting at uh, University of Michigan, uh, three uh, uh, planetary, at uh, planetary atmosphere people, uh, were, th were thinking about why the Earth's uh, uh, has it been habitable and has a you know quasi stable uh, climate over billions of years, despite the you know the brightening of the sun, and they came up with this idea of the negative feedback from from the temperature dependence of of silicate weathering, and right at the end of this classic 1981 paper in JGR, in the last page, they do a little thought experiment. They say. Well, if the, the white albedo disaster, which is what the climate people called what we now call snowball, uh, had actually occurred, they said, well, you know, it wouldn't be permanent because you wouldn't be able to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere because CO2 is only soluble in rainwater. It's not soluble in snow. So you couldn't get, but, but plate tectonics would continue. So you'd continue to have volcanism, CO2 being emitted into the atmosphere, but you couldn't get rid of it. And so it would accumulate. And it would accumulate over millions and millions and millions of years because to get out of the snowball, you would need about three orders of magnitude more CO2 than we have in the present atmosphere. It would take a long time, millions to tens of million years, but eventually you'd have sufficient CO2 greenhouse forcing that you would then suddenly deglaciate. Okay. And so here's the scenario. If, if, the, if the polar caps get to this, crit, this tipping point, then you go into the snowball earth, everything becomes frozen, and you eventually cover most of the continents with it. And the CO2 builds up, but because um, you know it's a geometrical relationship, so as you get more and more CO2, the effect on the climate gets less and less. So this becomes relative to temperature, gets flatter and flatter. So the duration of the snowball earth could be highly variable, but at some critical point here, you reach the point where at the equator, the sea glacier starts to collapse and you open up the dark water. And then now all the, the you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the feedbacks are running in the other direction. You abruptly deglaciate probably in a thousand years or so. You still got this huge overload of CO2. So you go into the hottest climate there's ever been. And then with silicate weathering over a period of some millions of years, then you return back to the your, to the ambient state. And this is the cycle. And, um, uh, you know, two things it predicts is that the onsets and, and, and termination should be globally synchronous and they should la and the thing should last for millions to tens of millions of years. So I got really attracted because you know, it's not that common in geology where you have a striking phenomenon like this, for, which has a really good theory, which makes you know, strong predictions which can be tested geologically. So um, uh, Joe Kirschvink at, at Caltech was the one who came up with the name Snowball Earth and he became convinced of it because of the paleomagnetic data. <clears throat> and um, and and so he pr proposed the, the first geological application of this idea. He didn't work out the idea of the self-reversing um, albedo uh, uh, catastrophe that was already in existence, but, but Joe was the first one to apply this to the geological record. This is a great story because uh, Joe didn't know about cap carbonates, which is the thing I was most interested in. So one of the unique features of these cryogenic glaciations, and you see it everywhere, is that they're directly overlain by, by uh, sequences of carbonate, meters to 
tens to even 100 meters thick with bizarre structures and isotopic compositions. They're known as cap carbonates, and they sit directly and sharply on top of the last glacial deposits virtually everywhere. And, and, and you know, and glacial deposits of other age don't have these. And of course, this was a great paradox, because why would you have these warm water deposits directly sitting on top of the glacial deposits? And it's not just the fact that, that you know, the snow bowler suddenly warms. It's much better than that. The real story uh, and, and why this was such a beautiful test and why I became really convinced of this, because the theory explained these cap carbonates, and that's because of the ocean de acidification. OK, so as the CO2 builds up, the ocean gets more and more acidic, but it does so very slowly because the CO2 is building up gradually. And as a result of the slowness of the acidification, the ocean can be buffered. The seawater can be buffered by carbonate dissolution. And so it maintains its saturation state. But what happens is an enormous amount of carbonate builds up in solution in this low pH seawater. Okay, that will eventually happen to our CO2, but the limiting time scale is the carbonate dissolution, which is thousands of years. So it's not very socially helpful. But on the snowball earth time scale, what happens is the ocean is buffered that moderates the, the, the acidity, but, but builds up a, a, a huge you know, load of dissolved calcium carbonate in, in seawater. And then, of course, when the when when the snowball you know collapses and it deglaciates, the ocean suddenly warms, and the, the, you know the, all the shelves get flooded, and you've got intense weathering, and and so the pH rises, and so all these things are pushing the so all you know the saturation up, and so all that dissolved carbonate you know dumps back out again. <laughs> and that's the cap carbonate. And that's why the cap carbonate has much the same composition as the underlying carbonate, the preglacial carbonate, because it's the same carbon. Okay. So that would, that's what really convinced me that, that independent of, of the hypothesis, because Joe didn't even know about cap carbonates, uh, that, you know, the theory explained this striking geological phenomenon. Not everyone bought into it so readily, however. The geological community, I think, really became convinced as a result of this geochronological data. And so this has come out over the last six years. And so um, this is a kind of busy slide here, but here's the time scale here. And each one of these four boxes is blown up so I can show the geochron data. So the black is the uranium lead uh, zircon. The fat ones are the TIMS. This is the uh, in situ. Uh, the red uranium osmium isochron uh, ages from organic matter in sediment. Okay, so this is the onset of the Sturdian glaciation here. So this is this little 10 million year box, 720 to 710. And these are the constraints. The gray arrows indicate maximum constraints pointing to the right, minimum constraints pointing to the left. And as you can see, the only age which satisfies all these data is 717 with a resolution of about 1 million years. And note that these data come from different cratons that were far separate in this time. Okay, so here's the, now the termination of the Sturdian glaciation. Same story here. Now we have about a 2 billion year bar, a 2 million year bar at between 661 and 663, okay? And that means the Sturdian glaciation lasted 55, 56 million years. <laughs> That's a staggering duration. Some people claim that this is actually multiple glaciations, but nowhere is there more than one cap carbonate. Only one cap carbonate, and everywhere it's been dated, it's, it's 661. And uh, so 56 million. The onset of the Maranon is still, still a little fuzzy. We don't really have this well pinned down. It's somewhere between 650, you know, 640 or so. The termination of the Maranon is nailed at 635. On multiple cratons. Okay, so this is the data I think that uh, really got people convinced. Here, this is another um, really important, I think, uh, uh, you know, piece of work by Camille Parton, who's actually a tectonic geologist. She's up in northwest Greenland studying the Rinkian. But as soon as these dates came out next year, she followed up on this. And, and said, well, and if we know the duration of these glacial periods, we can estimate from the known thicknesses of the glacial deposits, the rate of, 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 uh, of glacial deposition. So here on a plot of net thickness, that's over the entire glacial period, uh, against duration of deposition. And, and so these oblique lines here are the constant accumulation rates. And the reason to do that is that, of course, the accumulation rate 
uh, is also a function of the integration time because of incompleteness of the stratigraphic record as Peter Sadler's contribution. So the, the, the accumulation rates go down as the averaging time increases. And so it's important to compare the accumulation rate for the Marinoan or the Sturdian with younger glacial deposits of equivalent duration. Okay? And as you can see in both cases here, the, the accumulation rates are about an order of magnitude slower than for any younger glaciation. And of course, this is consistent with the weak hydrologic cycle of the extremely cold snowball atmosphere. Notice that this, this uh, short-lived e mid Ediacaran glaciation is, uh, which is not a snowball, way too short, uh, from Judy Poo's work, less than 400,000 years or so. You can see it, it falls right on the, on the Phanerozoic curve. Now, so how does this fit into our, uh, <laughs> our conflict uh, about the uh, primary producers? So this statement is what we could call a truism. Okay, <laughs> this has to be true. All living things descended from the survivors of cryogenian glaciations. So as long as there were cryogenian glaciations, as long as we accept that, the statement must be true. So let's think a little bit about the implications of this, because as I mentioned, um, the problem is that, and this is a plot of uh, time it takes after the ocean is frozen, uh, how quickly, and this is given uh, a significant dust flux, which actually, you know, dirty makes the ice a little dirtier and so it doesn't thicken quite as fast. What you can see here is that this ice gets, you know, 100 meters thick, which is way too thick to, for any sunlight to get through, you know, very quickly, right, within a thousand years or so. And so for most of Snowball Earth, you know, the, the ice is extremely thick. So let's consider the, uh, the major ice masses on Snowball Earth uh, to begin, because what, where we're headed here is, is to consider um, what habitats and, uh, and, and, and what ecosystems are going to survive uh, these events, because <laughs> the survivors give rise to us. So let's start with the uh, with, with the sea glacier, as it's called, the, the, the ice shelf on the ocean. Now, because it's dynamic, because it flows under its own weight, like an ice shelf, it has brought nearly uniform thickness. The equatorial ice is only, you know, a few tens of meters uh, thinner than the polar ice. And that's very interesting because that means the polar ice is, uh, given the very cold air temperature, is much thinner than it would be in a thermal equilibrium. So it's kind of, and it's because of outflow. So it's continually freezing at the bottom here, trying to get thicker. Whereas here, it's, it's actually thicker than it would like to be, given the, the warm Air to surface air temperatures. And so here you have melting. And so as a result, this, this gives a flow of this darker ice. This is marine ice, and this is frozen seawater, and it's clear. And it's freezing here and melting here and flowing towards the equator. Um, this has an interesting effect on the ocean. Uh, you're losing much more heat much more rapidly through the polar ice because it has a much steeper thermal gradient. And the ocean, which is extremely well mixed, <laughs> it's extremely well mixed because it's only being heated from the bottom, okay? There's no heat from the top. It's only losing heat to the top. So, you know, you know it's, it's, snowball is a perfect example of why it's bad to think by analogy. If you think by analogy, you say, oh, you know, the modern ocean needs winds. And uh, so if you take away the winds by covering the, uh, the ocean with ice, it'll stagnate. <laughs> it's completely wrong. What you have to do is think like a physicist. You have to think from, from first principles. And the first principle is in the snowball ocean, the only heat source is geothermal. And if you heat from the bottom, of course, it convects. So what I, it's a very interesting convection. There's lots of little eddies. looks like the atmosphere of Jupiter. And they're all inclined. They climb along isopycnals. Uh, and they're slanted upwards here because most of the heat is getting out here. The atmosphere is also very interesting. And the main feature is because it has a solid surface. And the solid surface means there's very, very little thermal inertia, okay? The surface temperature adjusts almost Im immediately to the, uh, to, to the local and, and, and instantaneous uh, uh, insulation of the incoming radiation. And so as a result, you have very strong Hadley convection because you got to get that heat up to the top of the atmosphere to, to have an energy balance. A very strong Hadley convection, but it's very tight. The tropopause is quite low. 
And um, but it migrates the upwelling zone where, where you know at the maximum insulation is migrating back and forth over the seasons, and it goes far off the equator because of the solid surface. And as a result, over most of the year, the equator is actually in a net downwelling in the atmosphere. And so, unlike any other uh, climate situation on Earth, there's only one desert on Snowball Earth, and it's right at the equator, straddles the equator. And the maximum accumulation is in the subtropics. So the hydrologic cycle in the annual mean is reversed from the normal, because normally we have maximum rain here and, and, and the deserts are here. In Snowball Earth, there's only one desert. It's on the equator, unlike the four deserts that we have in, in the normal climate, two subtropical and two polar deserts. Okay. So, um, the, so this ice is moving. This is the, uh, the, the vector here, 50 meters per million years. And um, so it's, everything is very dynamic. And the dynamic means that any dust or volcanic ash that falls anywhere uh, ends up at the surface here. Okay, And this turns out to be critically important. Uh, a word about the continental ice sheets. Um, this is from the work of Guillaume Lehir, who's in Paris at, uh, at uh, EPGP. And um, he's the first one to actually look at the snowball and in an atmosphere ice sheet model uh, at different levels of CO2. And surprisingly, because we thought that this, the continents probably get completely covered by ice, uh, and surprisingly, as the CO2 gets higher, uh, the, actually the ice sheets get smaller. They're, they're going faster because the hydrologic cycle is spinning up, but the mass balance actually is reduced. And the important point is that at all stages in the snowball, there are significant areas that are not ice covered. Okay, and that's in addition to probably lots of uh, coastal dry valleys because of catabatic winds. And this is very important because note that these dry air, these dry valley areas, these areas of bare ground, are exactly where the Hadley cells are, where there are very strong surface winds in the summer hemisphere. In the winter hemisphere, you get an inversion at the surface, and, and so you have strong winds, but the surface doesn't feel it. But in the summer, there's strong winds at the surface. And uh, now, oh, and the other thing I should say, point out also from Guillaume Lear's work, is that these ice sheets are quite sensitive to orbital forcing. So they expand and contract. The mass balance changes quite significantly on even processional time scale. At processional time scale, only when CO2 is moderate to high, but at longer uh, orbital periods, um, probably also at low CO2 also. And these ice margins migrate in his model by, you know, by up to uh, you know, several thousand uh, kilometers um, on, on a processional time scale. So uh, this fits with the geology. This is the Port Escape formation. This is uh, Tony Spencer, who did his magnificent work, still one of the best uh, studies of these glacial deposits. And he documented 14 successive till sheets on the Dalradian shelf. And the top of each one is covered by these polygonal sand wedges. Okay? So these are periglacial soil uh, phenomenon. And, they, and so what this shows is that 14 times you have an ice sheet that advanced across this low latitude marine shelf, depositing a sheet of till, and then the ice withdrew, uh, allowing the till to be exposed to the cold atmosphere and, and to allow these, uh, these polygonal sand wedges to develop. So 14 times in this geological record, you have this back and forth across this low latitude marine shelf. Now, if you've ever been to a glacier, <laughs> you know it's a very dusty place because there's lots of wind because the winds are, you know, they, they, the air over the ice gets cold and so it gets dense and it sinks and you get these so-called catabatic winds. This is the fern and in, in, we call it Chinook in North America. So there's lots of winds and, and the glaciers make sediment by quarrying and abrasion. Okay, and the abrasion makes dirt, dust, powder. And of course, the, the quarrying makes blocks, and that's why we have dimectons. And uh, but this powder, this rock flour, that that gets easily lofted by these winds, so the dust gets widely distributed. So here's the list of uh, of Asia that's coming from the Scandinavian and Alpine ice sheets. It's pretty impressive in its distribution. Now, <laughs> the biological significance of dust on ice was first worked out by. Uh, had off Eric Nordenschult, uh, who came from a very famous scientific family uh, living at the time in Helsinki. And uh, Nordenschult, who was a geologist originally, um, got uh, as a young man got an appointment at the University of Helsinki, but then he made a mistake. 
he signed a petition uh, lobbying for Finnish independence from Russia in 1855, which was right in the middle of the Crimean War. And uh, you have to understand for Russia, uh, the Crimean Peninsula and the warm water port, this is of great strategic importance. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, Norton Schultz lost his position and got kicked out of the country. But um, he got picked up um, in Stockholm at the university there. And he became most famous for the Vega expedition. This was the first circumnavigation of Eurasia and uh, the first uh, Northeast Passage, the first uh, uh, ship to sail the Arctic coast of, uh, of Eurasia uh, in uh, 1878. But eight, uh, eight years before that, he went to West Greenland. And uh, he went to West Greenland to resolve this old dispute as to whether the ice in Greenland was were just coastal mountains and there was a boreal forest in the interior, or alternatively, as uh, as maintained by Henrik Rink, for example, uh, that there was an ice sheet that covered the entire of Greenland. And so he wanted to get into the interior to see which of these true. But that meant that he had to climb up this very steep slope in the ablation zone of the Greenland ice sheet. So notice here, the big area, the huge area, and all the dust, anything else that falls here, all comes out and it gets exposed here. And so the problem with trying to climb up that steep slope is it's just covered with these pits of uh, water, about half a meter deep. And and as uh, and Norton Schultz complains in his uh, diary, he says, there's no, there's no place here to plant a boot, never mind a sleeping bag. And if you're going to the top of the Greenland ice sheet, you don't want to have a wet sleeping bag and wet boots. And of course, the reason for all this meltwater, despite the fact the air temperatures even in summer on the ice sheet are below zero, is because of this dark dust. Okay. And so Norton Schultz called it cryokonite, which means ice dust. And it's very dark because there's lots of cyanobacteria there. And because it's a very bright environment, the cyanobacteria are producing gobs of extracellular substance, sugar basically, polysaccharide is heavily pigmented. And um, so the cyanobacteria you know, get, you know, get colonized in there because the mineral dust is dark enough that it absorbs sunlight, get a little bit of film of water and the cyanobacteria get going. They're produced this heavily pigmented extracellular material. Uh, and that's a, you know, additional feedback that absorbs sunlight and allows uh, these melt, this meltwater. Now, uh, Norton shall realize that, that these holes with the dirt at the bottom, he realized there was a lot of organic matter in there and, in, and some interesting organisms. And so he reported on this. And of course, so this has fascinated polar ecologists for you know, ever since. So here's the same thing. This is in, in a uh, Piedmont uh, glacier, Canada glacier in Taylor Valley in Antarctica. Same, same story. And here's what these things contain. And these uh, cryokonite holes, as they're called, contain this pretty similar assemblage of organisms wherever you go. The Himalayan glaciers have the same thing. So about 10% of the dirt is, uh, is, is, you know, is a product of cyanobacteria. There are also eukaryotic algae, exclusively green algae. This is important because the green algae are what become the dominant producers after the cryogenium. Green algae. So these are these are eukaryotic algae. Snow algae, for example, I know they're pink, but they're greens. And also heterotrophs, because there's all this organic matter, all this food being produced, mainly by the cyanobacteria, but also by the greens. There's so there's fungi, and there are also protists. And there are, there are three uh, groups of uh, derived. Uh, um, uh, metazoans, uh, nematodes, tardigrades, and rotifers. Uh, these all have this uh, enzyme trellose, which allows them to self-desiccate because these holes freeze solid in uh, winter. Now, on, on ice shelves uh, or on the sea glacier and snowball earth where you don't have such good drainage, these things aren't just holes. These are lakes. Okay? They're ice covered, but the ice covers are quite thin in summer when, the, when there's sunlight. So there's lots of light getting through this ice, and uh, so there's lots of uh, 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 primary production going on here, okay? And because you've got sunlight and uh, limited nutrients and liquid water coexisting. So already 20 years ago, Warwick Vincent, who's a New Zealander, who spent his entire career, um, the first 
quarter century or so in Antarctica, mainly in the McMurdo area, and then they, the last 25 years or so in Arctic Canada, studying this these, uh, these uh, ice shelves in Arctic Canada, which unfortunately are now gone. Warthog ice shelf is disintegrated in 2013. Uh, studying primarily uh, the cyanobacterial uh, communities here. And already 20 years ago, Warwick was saying, this is where life, including eukaryotic life, will have thrived and evolved and survived uh, the snowball glaciations. Okay. Now, I, in fact, I think in snowball, uh, this environment is even more benign than modern polar, because as I mentioned in the polar regions today, uh, these meltwater holes or ponds, they freeze solid in winter. But at the equator, although there's a stronger seasonal cycle with a solid surface than there is with the watery surface, nevertheless, it's less than it is in polar. The, the, the big uh, cycle in temperature is the diurnal cycle. So I think that there probably was liquid water throughout the year. Uh, and uh, these things may have been open to the atmosphere uh, in, in late afternoon, in the warmest part of the day. So uh, this is what I think the snowball earth looked like. And uh, this ablation zone where all the dust and volcanic ash that falls anywhere all accumulates here and uh, allows meltwater to form on top of the ice. Okay, now this is fresh water because it's melt, you know, melted glacier water. This is 12% of global surface area. It's about 60 million square kilometers. Okay? But there's a problem. And the problem is that if you take the dust flux at the last glacial maximum in Antarctica, uh, it works out to between one and 10 meters per million years. And so over the duration of a snowball earth, this ablation zone is gonna get completely covered, completely saturated with dust. And the problem is if you saturate it with dust, you insulate the ice. Sure, the climate is a bit warmer, but you can't warm the ice because it's insulated by the dust and you can't get out of snowball earth. <laughs> but of course, uh, you know, there is a way and it's the same way it works in the modern. And that is when you get too much meltwater, the meltwater forms drainages and those drainages find a crack somewhere. And the water starts to seep through that crack and the latent heat of the meltwater and the kinetic energy of the falling water opens up. They, these cracks get bigger and bigger and they're called moulins, right? And here's this meltwater going down, down a moulin. And this drainage cleanses the ice of the dust. And so in fact, you have a negative feedback here. So if you get, if the dust flux increases, you get more meltwater, you get more efficient drainage, which cleanses the ice better. And if the dust flux wanes, then the cleansing doesn't work so well and the dust builds up. So, if it, so this could last for quite a long time. But of course, CO2 is slowly rising. So I, actually, I think this meltwater flushing through moulins is extremely important because remember, this dust is 10% organic matter, right? And it's falling into water that's about minus four degrees because it's hypersaline because of all the ice. So respiration rates are going to be extremely low because of the low temperature. Okay? Respiration rate, respiration more sensitive to temperature than production. So you have a way of burying organic matter during snowball earth, and that's important because that allows oxygen production. And you have to have oxygen production to counteract the consumption of oxygen by volcanic gases and also by weathering. I mean, there's at least seafloor weathering, slow because of the cold temperature, but there's some. And we've got volcanism, so there's mostly reduced gases. So we know from geological evidence, there's, there's no evidence that we went back to the Archean. It, you know, there's no reappearance of uh, mass independent sulfur isotope fractionation, for example. So it looks like there's always oxygen there. So I think this is the reason, is moulin flushing. Okay, now this environment, this habitat that I've talked about so far is a freshwater habitat. And because the snowball onset is very fast, for those organisms that were living in the tropical ocean beforehand, they don't have a chance to adapt. What survives is what was, is what was pre-adapted. That's these polar meltwater-based ecosystems. But now I want to talk about another ecosystem, which is more varied and is not necessarily freshwater. Okay? And that are these little things here, these, coast, these, these ice-covered lakes in the coastal environment. So here's Lake Vida, Lake Vanda, Lake Trixel, Taylor Valley, that we were just looking at the cryoconite on this glacier here. So let's look at these. So this is a very interesting habitat. 
So uh, these lakes are ice covered. They're ice covered throughout the year. Sometimes uh, this one doesn't, but some of the larger ones uh, have a little moat in summer. These lakes are recharged by meltwater from the adjacent ice sheets. Okay? But because of the intense sublimation off the top here, these lakes become hypersaline. And because they're hypersaline, the ice cover is thin. And so you can do lots of photosynthesis. So this is Lake Vanda. You can see it's only, you know, in summer, you know, two or three, four meters of clear ice. So there's lots of photosynthesis going on underneath this ice, both planktonic, picocyanobacteria, synecococcus, in extraordinary abundances, and also benthic cyanobacteria, including nitrogen fixes. Now, it turns out this is a, just a fascinating. These, these lakes are called meromictic, which means salt stratified. Okay? And uh, here's the stratification in Lake Vanda. So at the top, you have cold, highly oxygenated freshwater. And this is the ice cover. Then you have a layer here that's undergoing thermohaline convection. Okay? It's somewhat saltier. Okay? And it has uniform temperature because of the strong convection. And then you have a chemocline, also a thermocline in the him. And then at the bottom, you have warm water, 24 degrees C down here. <laughs> this weird situation where you have warm water at the bottom and cold water at the top. And the reason for it is because of the salinity stratification. So this is highly saline. Okay? And that's what gives it the excess density. So it stays down here at the bottom. It's also completely anoxic, okay? full of H2S and lots of green sulfur bacteria, which are incidentally anaerobic phototrophs. It's still light down here. So in, in each one of these, these layers, you have a different microbial community in, in both the plankton and also in the benthos. Right? So guess where the maximum chlorophyll counts are, where the maximum you know, uh, primary production would, would be here. Is it up here where there's lots of sunlight? No, it's right down here. First of all, there's more nutrients here, but mainly because it's warm. So even these organisms that are, you know, polar adapted, they still, you know, like it a lot better where it's warm. So they're, they're you know, they're waiting for snowball to end. So a couple of photographs, these are just some of the mats. And, uh, and as I say, the, the plankton are dominated by Synecococcus, which is one of the main, one of the two main, uh, the synpro of the synpro clade in the in the modern ocean. These are tiny, okay, one micrometer, and uh, and these are in extraordinary abundances. There's a lake over in the Vestfold Hills, which is over in the Indian Ocean sector of uh, coastal East Antarctica, where in summer they measured up to 15 million cells per milliliter. <laughs> Think about that: 15 million cells per milliliter. That's Ace Lake right up here. So this is the abundance in uh, cells per uh, per milliliter uh, at different latitudes. These this is the modern ocean. Uh, this is Ace Lake, and um, and so this is 15 times more than occurs anywhere in the modern ocean. But notice this interesting: in the polar oceans today, there are hardly any cyanobacteria, and the reason is because the, the, the polar oceans are nutrient rich. And so the cyanobacteria, which are the masters of oligotrophy, they can't compete with diatoms. They can't compete with the higher organisms, which, are, which really do well in nutrient-rich environments. So these do well in, uh, in oligotrophic environments. Okay. So now what happens when the snowball melts? Well, here's the snowball, and uh, here's what happens when it melts. You're basically putting a kilometer or two of melt water fresh meltwater low density on top of icy cold uh, brine. So this is a very stable density stratification. And furthermore, it's being heated intensively at the top, which also increases the stability of the density stratification by this, uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 ppm CO2 atmosphere. So it tur turns out it takes tens of thousands of years for the uh, for the ocean to mix, but still short on a geologic time scale, uh, and probably faster along continental margins. Okay, and enhanced upwelling here, somewhat cooler here, probably also some of this cold water coming up, and um, and eventually, uh, and of course, you know, because of this massive influx of uh, ice sheets, you get huge flooding. So all those meromictic lakes. And uh, all the superglacial, uh, you know, uh, meltwater ponds, I mean, that, that all finds itself in the ocean. 
And so you get a big re-radiation of the ocean. And here's an echococcus, and it's uh, even tinier uh, prochlorococcus, which are the dominant uh, primary producers in the gyres, uh, unlike the polar oceans in the, in, in the modern. So I see this diagram a little bit differently. Rather than saying that this is a time when organisms were excluded from the ocean, I call this the time of marine neocolonization, okay? Because I believe the fossil evidence. I believe there were marine fossils back here, but back to the truism, this is the, the converse statement. There are no living descendants of clades that failed to survive. Okay? So those marine uh, cyanobacteria and eukaryotes, they were related to ones that did survive in freshwater, but distantly because, you know, the freshwater and, and, and non-marine uh, microbial communities are quite distinct genetically. Um, the marine ones existed are, do, do not have descendants. And so therefore you don't see them in molecular phylogenomics because it's just exclusively living organisms. So, okay, so is there any evidence for this? All right, so here's a very important uh, community of, uh, of organisms from the pre cryogenian So this is around 810 million years ago. This is Phoebe Cohen's work. These are phosphatic scale microfossils, they're called, extraordinarily diverse and disparate. So six new genera and 17 new species described from this one community, okay? Diverse, disparate, and extinct, okay? These things are beautifully, you know, preserved and developed. They are, these things are made of phosphate, okay? There, there's no non-animal known in the modern world that makes phosphatic skeletons. And so this is an extinct form. Um, I'm going to introduce a topic now about the, about how molecular clocks are calibrated. Okay, most molecular clocks now no longer go along with that strict assumption of constant mutation rates because it turned out that different organisms have very different uh, mutation rates in, in vertebrates twice as fast as as vertebrates, for example. And so now uh, most clocks are called relaxed clocks. Bayesian relaxed molecular clocks, and that means they're calibrated to the fossil record. And there's a danger here. Okay, the danger is that if you calibrate the clocks to the fossil record, everybody's happy because they're in agreement, but you've lost the independence. Okay, in science, the value of having data from a different discipline is it's independent of the data that gave rise, say, to a hypothesis. So you can test it, it's a legitimate test. Okay. If, 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 if the result is, is, is calibrated with, you know, you lose the independence. So you gain something, but you lose something, I think, very important. So anyway, um, Burkhardt Becker, a few years ago now, uh, looked at the, uh, at, at the green algae and saw this great divide, okay, between the chlorophytes and the streptophytes, mainly marine, almost exclusively freshwater. And he, he said, well, you know, maybe this is a product of snowball earth because of this binary, salin you know, salinity. You can be in meltwater, which is fresh, okay, and you become a streptophyte, and, and you live in a meromictic lake, which is salty, and uh, at least down where it's warm, and you become a chlorophyte. And, you know, it's a pretty reasonable idea, but nobody believes it. And the reason nobody believes it is because of the fossil record. So this is believed to be, this is interpreted uh, based on morphology as a, as a cladophoran green alga. I don't think much doubt this, this is a green alga. Mag beautifully preserved, <clears throat> this from north, northeast China, uh, much more completely preserved than the original um, Proterocletus that was described from uh, Svanberg Fjellet formation in Svalbard by Nick Butterfield. This is an ovophysian. And uh, ovophysians are a highly derived group. And this is a billion years old. Okay, so if this is really an ovophysian, that pushes the entire green, al green algal tree back into the mesoproterozoic. So the problem here is that, you know, despite this beautiful preservation, okay, and there's a hold fast and branching and there's, you know, differentiated cells and et cetera, this is still morphologically a fairly simple form, and presumably it's adaptive. So how do we know that the 
oval fissian algae of today aren't a product of convergence with this, but this is actually not a crown group, but a stem group. In other words, a, an extinct clade that, that, that does not have direct descendants in, in the modern record or in the modern one. So here is the, the core of the green algae. These are the streptophytes over here, the land dwellers. These are mainly marine forms. Some of your well-known ones here, Halamida and Acetabularia. These are two main carbonate producers in the Great Bahama Bank. And here's this big radiation. This is the cryogenian snowballs here. These are, see, here's the cladophorans here. This is a highly derived group, okay? So if this is true, uh, that pushes this entire tree, you know, way older than snowballers. So snowballers doesn't have anything to do with this. So this is the, uh, this is the um, Vangiomorpha of uh, Nick Butterfield. And this is sort of everyone's poster child for a, uh, a crown group. Um, um, red, uh, you know, multicellular red alga. Um, now well dated uh, from uh, Halverson's group from uh, Tim Gibson at uh, what, 1046 or something like that. But this assignment as a crown group is disputed in this paper. And this paper cogently points out that the criteria that were used to identify this as a crown group, in fact, are common to a number of groups of red algae and in fact appears to be basal. And uh, so once again, I, I, I have no doubt that this is a, a multicellular red alga, but uh, I don't know that it's a crown group. Now, I don't know whether paleontologists are gonna be very happy uh, if I start claiming that their uh, crown groups are actually stem groups, but let's remember that biologists only became interested in fossils when it became apparent that most fossils represent extinct organisms. And no biologist would bother with a fossil when they had living organisms. It's only when fossils became the only way of knowing the inhabitants of these former worlds that they became interested in fossils. I mean, before that, fossils were only interesting as to how they got mineralized and why they were marine fossils were above modern sea level. So I'm basically saying the same thing for the pre, much of the pre cryogenian record. Okay, so are there some other uh, data sets that we could look at for support for this view that the pre-cryogenian primary producers um, were, uh, were not directly related to modern ones? So this is um, uh, one of a cluster of papers that's come out of the ANU group of Jochen Brox recently and backed up by other workers as well. Um, and it ba basically their point is that from the steering to hopane ratio, which tells you something about the proportions of, uh, in the organic matter produced in the oceans, uh, these are from carrageens and oils. Um, uh, these, so these are fossil molecules. Uh, Sterines are produced by eukaryotes, hopanes by bacteria, that after the sturdy and snowball, you have a big jump, and that's permanent thereafter, in, in sterines, and that is algae, as major primary producers. And uh, the, the uh, steer, steering is uh, derived from the sterile stigma, stigma stain. Um, and so that's a, a diagnostic of green algae. So green algae for the first time become important in primary production between the two snowballs, right? At, not immediately after, immediately after it's too hot, so you have only bacteria. But then before the marinoan, you start for the first time to have lots of steering. Okay, but that's not, the, that's not what I want to emphasize here. Back here, when it looks like, for reasons we don't understand, most of the primary production in the ocean was from bacteria, uh, not, uh, not algae. I have an idea on that, but I won't go into it. There are some, however, there are some steerings. They're rare. Okay, and they're not contributing much, but they are there. But they're this one called cryostain. And this steering so far is not known to be produced by any modern organism. Okay. And maybe it'll turn up, but so far not known to be produced by any modern organism. So that suggests there's something going on here, at least in the algae, that not related to, to, to modern forms. This is a paper, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what this paper means, but, but very briefly what it says, and if you look at organic matter overall, and you look at the isotopic composition of the organic matter and the coexisting carbonate, and look at the difference between the two, it's different than marine product in the oceans today. So they're assuming that the, that the cyanobacteria that produce this based on the biomarkers is, is somehow is, 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 uh, is different. It's a, it's a beta, 
uh, picocyanobacteria, bay or some, some type of pl planktonic probably some, uh, bacteria, uh, and, but which is uh, fixing carbon through a different physiological process than, than modern synpro. Okay? That's the story. So, the, so just from the carbon isotopes, there's something different going on back here relative to the modern. And then um, finally, uh, here is an interesting finding from a few years ago. This is not about primary producers. This is about um, you know heterotrophs, <laughs> people that eat food rather than produce it. And uh, this group studied a tidal flat on Disco Island at 70 degrees north in uh, West Greenland, and they sampled it for for protists, for unicellular heterotrophs. Right? And they compared the diversity and the uh, ancestry of the of the of the DNA. In, uh, in, in this community, and they compared it with, with tidal flats in a number of different environments all over the world, including tropical ones. And of course, they expected this one to be very depauperate, and they found exactly the opposite. Unexpectedly, the Arctic community emerged as one of the richest observed to date, and the most diverse in ancestral lineages. <laughs> no surprise to me, of course, because I'm saying that we all evolved as a subset of this, okay? Snowballers came far too fast for adaptation. What, what, you know, what survived were the, what were the, the habitats, the ecosystems that were pre-adapted. These are these polar and alpine ecosystems. Okay, uh, last a word about animals. Okay, so this is the uh, Cambrian conundrum of uh, the other one. And uh, this is a molecular clock from Kevin Peterson. Uh, these are fossils. Um, the dots here are the estimated crown group first appearances. And you would expect there should be metazoan, multicellular animal fossils back here, but we don't find anything. Okay, I, I think the first, uh, the first fossils, and they look like stem groups. Uh, these are the Wungan phosphor phosphoride things. They, they don't look like a crown group from their late stages of, uh, of embryonic development. Um, these are the soft-bodied Ediacara uh, biota here. Nick Butter I put them here only because Nick Butterfield has a recent paper saying they're Nidarians, but most people think they're stem groups. And, uh, you know, so wh where are they? Well, um, Doug Irwin tells me that uh, early animals uh, did not have regulatory mechanism to control salinity in the fluids inside their cells. And so I think for early metazoans, snowball may, may have been a problem because there's nothing much on snowball that looks like ambient seawater salinity. And uh, so I don't know whether there's any truth to this, but it's possible, I think, that uh, the snowballs might actually have retarded a multicellular animal. Uh, evolution. So, um, so here's my pitch. Uh, I think we need to take uh, the biological and the evolutionary implications of uh, cryogenia and geology seriously. And uh, that means uh, learning a little bit uh, about uh, the ecology of, uh, of habitats that were probably important uh, in this climate state. And I think if we do that, uh, we will reach a deeper understanding of biological evolution and uh, life as we know it, All right? That's my pitch. Thanks for listening.
Yeah, well, following the um, uh, the Sturdian, uh, of course, there would have been a very intense uh, uh, warming period. And so things would have had to get through that. Uh, of course, you can always go deep or go north or south. Um, and, uh, and just to comment on the fossils, um, you're referring to Hans Hoffman's uh, twitchet disks, which occur between the two snowball events in the uh, Kenzie Mountains of northwestern Canada. Um, yeah, I, uh, and I knew, uh, I knew Hans well and was respected him greatly as a, as a gentleman and as a paleontologist. Um, they, those things haven't really been reproduced much anywhere else. And um, yeah, no. they're just, just, you know, they're, they're circular. You know, they, they could be little volcanos. Uh, so they're a bit iffy. The Algerian ones I don't accept. That's based on a bogus uh, correlation with uh, Senegal. Uh, Adam Malouf, uh, you know, got his serial sectioning uh, instrument up and running. And uh, since that time, we haven't had a, heard another word about the supposed sponges. So to me, the first thing that looks like a sponge, and it's a single specimen, is uh, the one from the Wongan phosphorite. Um, the, uh, the biomarkers, uh, the 24 IPC and the 26 uh, uh, MC, um, I think that that's strictly on hold now. That that looks like uh, you know not only can be produced by uh, by um, well, it looks like it's most likely just a decay product of uh, of, of uh, stigma stain. So I think that that's um, this is the biomarkers from Oman. So uh, I'm uh, I my read of the of the fossil evidence is that there's nothing. Um, there, there's no even crown group multicellular animal uh, before Doshan 12, say long on phosphorate is about 609 um, but the same forms may occur earlier than that but not so well preserved um, and it, uh, I'm not sure that there's any really uh, robust evidence for a crown group uh, until the white sea assemblage which is you know what 650, 655 John, okay. Uh, yeah. to the YouTube questions there. Yeah, I'll just jump in. First of all, Paul, I want to thank you for what was just a magnificent talk. It was really, really, it was a combination of just really educational, really informative, but also very, very entertaining. So really, really appreciate um, you delivering that talk. Uh, we've got a couple of questions on the chat here on YouTube, but also uh, a question here from uh, Murray Hitzman. Brendan, the um, YouTube appears to have switched off. Can you have a look at that? I'll just go with Murray's question here first, and then we'll go to the YouTube uh, cues. Uh, Murray's question is, how would you work the cryogenian iron formations in? Do you think there's any relation to distinct populations? Yeah, I, I agree with Max Lechte. Um, and it, I think it fits also with Galen Halverson's iron isotope work. And so, um, yeah, uh, the, you expect that there would be iron in solution uh, in, in, the, um, in the ocean, and the ocean would be ferruginous, the snowball ocean would be ferruginous rather than uh, euxinic. Um, and, but you, and of course, you need an oxidant to get iron formation. And the most likely oxidant is uh, meltwater. Uh, discharges from meteoric ice because the meteoric ice should have air bubbles, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so it would be where you have uh, along grounding lines where you have uh, subglacial meltwater uh, that's oxygenated gets discharged into ferruginous anoxic uh, brine, and that's where the iron formation is going to going to tend to precipitate, and that's consistent with the observation in a number of areas, particularly in the Mackenzie Mountains in northwestern Canada, that the iron formation is is thickest uh, in the most proximal faces, uh, to, you know, toward the ice margin in a marine environment, and 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 becomes much thinner in the more distal phases, and that's the opposite that you might expect. Uh, you might expect where the sedimentation rates are lower, you tend to have more chemical sediments, but you don't. They're, they seem to be proximal. And uh, that fits with, uh, with uh, Max Lechte's uh, work on the, on the iron isotopes as well. So what I can't really explain so well is why the iron formations all only seem to be in the Sturdian and not in the Marinoan. I don't think there are any, uh, uh, for certain, uh, Marinoan iron formations. There's one possibility um, in... Um, 
in the Sarah de Puga in, in, uh, in, in, in South America, but uh, it, that's not certain. Um, and so I'm not, I don't know that I have a really good uh, idea for that, uh, other than, of course, the Sturdian is preceded by this uh, very large uh, uh, equatorial large igneous province, the Franklin large igneous province, which is erupted right on the equator, uh, coincident with the Sturdian onset. And, um, and 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 uh, 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 McDonald and Wordsworth, of course, have have, have linked the two through uh, uh, through uh, volcanic uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, uh, because as it as it turns out, this large igneous province is erupted through the Shaler group, which is very rich in in uh, sulfate evaporates, and so it's known that those lavas have a very very high sulfur content. And if the climate was uh, was cold to be already as in the ambient state, then, then the tropopause would be low enough to be accessible to uh, fire fountains and okay, to thermal plumes. And, uh, and also at the equator, the, uh, the albedo effect of the stratospheric aerosol would be at the maximum. As you remember, the residence time in the stratosphere is only a matter of months. So you, you need it to continue. I, I think I've kind of lost the, uh, uh, oh yes, about the iron formations. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's my take on the on the iron formation. Uh, we have to be careful, however, uh, about this redog. I mean, we need the redog. We need an oxidant and we need anoxic water that's charged with iron. But, you know, it, remember uh, remember Blood Falls. Remember, so Blood Falls is at the mouth of the Taylor Glacier in Antarctica, mm -hmm. and it's uh, called Blood Falls because it's red. And uh, the, the water, the subglacial meltwater there is completely anoxic. And it has four and a half million molar of iron. <laughs> the ocean is billion parts per billion. There's the four and a half, you know, it's got half as much iron as there is calcium in normal seawater. And uh, and also there's 50 million molar of sulfate. This would be you know, <laughs> impossible to imagine you have sulfate and iron uh, in solution together. And the reason is because there's not enough organic matter to sustain sulfate reduction. <laughs> so there, of course, the iron precipitates when it hits the, the oxygenated atmosphere. So it's possible because of chemistry at the meltwater, because of long residence time to interact with, in this case, Ferrar dolerite uh, in the bedrock uh, for the meltwater not to be oxygenated, but to be iron charged. But I think in most cases, uh, the, the story of the iron formation is that it's, uh, it's related to the interaction of oxygenated meltwater and fruge in the snowball ocean water. It is very, very interesting. Um, we have a couple of really interesting questions on the chat on YouTube. This one from Misha Rule. If the global planet's dust flux ends up in two very narrow bands around the equator, um, mixed with some organic matter, do we see this, any sign of this in the sedimentary record? Is there any evidence for that? Yeah. So, so what, what specifically in the in the sedimentary record are we looking for? Any, I imagine any sign of either an organic rich um, band or maybe just a what was originally a dust layer or something which concentrated into a mud or a shale, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so these very fine-grained deposits are fairly common um, in, in in glacial sediments. Uh, one of the problems with this is that there seems to be a disproportionate concentration of continents at low latitude. And so we don't have good examples of, uh, of high-latitude continents. However, uh, one that is a potential test and potentially is problematic is Nantuo. So the, the latest paleomag uh, puts Nantuo, that's in South China, uh, in the mid-latitudes, okay? And I think that there are lots of fine-grained deposits there that are probably uh, uh, proglacial. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that the meltwater plumes also are charged with, uh, with lots of suspended sediment. So there are two sources of mud. Um, and, and incidentally, the, the ones that, uh, you know, from the, from the meltwater, uh, from underneath the glaciers, they also going to have lots of organic matter because remember the glaciers are running across tropical shelves. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And the sediments in those tropical shells will have, you know, all the organic matter there. So, you know, talking with Jochen Brox, he's doing, the, you know, got a, has a student uh, uh, working on biomarkers from the Sturdian event and the subsurface where they're, you know, preserved very low temperature. Um, the, the problem is going to be, the first order problem is going to be distinguishing the, the ambient living organic matter from the stuff that's reworked. I suspect that most of the organic matter in the snowball earth is, is detrital. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think we can get around that. And I think in, in the end, it'll look better because we'll, have to, we'll be able to distinguish them. Mm-hmm. But it's a complication. It's, yeah, yeah, it seems to be. Uh, um, a, a question, Paul, from uh, Juan Rodriguez. Um, do you think post-glaciation processes make more favorable uh, for the sort of massive formation of dolomite deposits during the late Precambrian, in comparison to, say, the Phanerozoic. Um, and Juan was asking that question specifically because during the Neoproterozoic, many stromatolites are observed to contain primary dolomite. So was there something curious or about the chemistry back then that just favored dolomite, primary dolomite? Well, I mean, low sulfate is the obvious one. Um, you know, it's been known, you know, ever since the work of, um, oh, what's her name? She was at Scripps. Um, you, you know, showed that orthogenic dolomite forms in organic roots layers, and it's because uh, of sulfate reduction. And sulfate looks like a dolomite inhibitor. So I think that's a f- sort of first and most obvious uh, uh, obvious one. Uh, the snowball, you know, one thing that puzzled me a bit, but because the Marinone caps are almost always dolomite, um, was that in um, uh, in the snowball ocean, <laughs> the snowball ocean should have super low magnesium relative to calcium, because you've got millions of years of seawater, uh, 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 you know, basalt interaction, but no no continental input, and so that uh, seawater basalt interaction is a source of uh, calcium because of, you know, spilletization and a sink for magnesium because of the formation of chloride. So you would expect the snowball ocean to have extremely low magnesium to calcium ratio. And that was a puzzle to me uh, about the Marino and Capdolomite. And of course, the, the, the answer is that the Marino and Capdolomite has nothing the main to do with the snowball ocean. It's formed from the meltwater lid. Mm. <laughs> and so the meltwater lid, we think, is where the sulfate comes from. So uh, Peter Crockford has discovered a very important thing about the barite. So the Marinon cap tends to have a lot of barite in it, in widely separate areas. And so the question is, uh, you know, to have barite, you have to have, you know, so much barite. And this is barite. It's actually growing on the seafloor. It looks like coral, but, it, but it's primary barite. And you layering everything. It's amazing stuff. And so the problem is to, to get barium and sulfate together, you need two different water masses. Is one that you know, has barium and one that has uh, sulfate. They can't coexist because of the extreme insolubility. And so, um, the most what, what Peter Crawford showed is that the, from barium isotopes is that all these barites are, are, are uniform. They have absolutely uniform uh, barium isotope compositions. And moreover, the, the composition is exactly the same as the modern ocean barium. And so that shows that the, uh, and this is quite unlike terrestrial barites or cold seep barites. Um, and, and so that means the snowball ocean is the source of the barium. And that means the meltwater lid is the source of the sulfur. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, and that, of course, is consistent with it carrying this app, this, um, yeah, this uh, oxygen isotope signal from stratospheric photochemistry. Because yeah. it's in the runoff. Wow. Um, if I may ask a, another couple of questions, um, Paul, because there's a few of them popping up here on the on the chat. Um, Benjamin asks, um, on one of your slides, you showed a more ancient snowball earth uh, event uh, titled Bruce. Um, what are your views on it and on its possible implication for the selection of freshwater organisms then, w- way back then? Yeah. Okay, so if there was a Siderian snowball, and I'm, I'm not convinced yet, okay, so the evidence is exclusively paleomagnetic, and it concerns two deposits only. The first is the Makanini uh, in South Africa, 
um, which has now been dated uh, to, to, um, uh, to feeders to uh, volcanics that are intercalated with the glacial deposits toward the end of the glaciation. This is the Machinini Formation, and uh, the age is around uh, 2430. And uh, Dave Evans did paleomag on the Anhuluk volcanics themselves and uh, got a very robust, extremely robust poll uh, that implies a, a, a latitude of uh, 11 degrees plus or minus 5 degrees, if I remember directly. So this is very low latitude. There's no, there's no other evidence of a snowball, but it was a very low latitude. I'm not too sure about that. It doesn't look like an alpine setting, but you know we don't know how, whether it's marine or non-marine. Um, and then Polysarca formation in um, in 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 in, uh, in the Karelia uh, is is but is the same age um, and uh, and also and not directly from pa Paleomag but Paleomag on uh, on 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 Gabros on Mafic uh, volcanics and intrusives but the same age also suggest a low latitude. Okay, so you have one event that. That for which there's pretty good paleomagnetic evidence, but no other evidence, and and no basis other than geochronology for correlation, and and none of the other Siderian or early Paleoproterozoic glaciations. There's any basis for correlation between craterlets, and moreover, there you know there's not much. They don't occur in, in thick carbonate sequences, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that's what that refers to. Uh, it's a bit of an old slide. It there was a time a few years ago when I was promoting the idea that. Um, the, uh, the this Machinini snowball um, correlated with the middle of the three Huronian glaciations, the Bruce, uh, and that's because the Bruce has a cap carbonate. It's the only one of these glaciations that has a cap carbonate. It's the only carbonate in the entire Huronian succession. We have no idea what latitude Huronian succession was at, um, except that early on in that succession, uh, we were at high latitude, but after that, we don't know. And uh, so I, I'm, uh, I don't think we have any basis for correlation yet. And my con one of my concerns is that there might not be enough time for full snowball in this, uh, during this period. So I think um, well, we, we, we just don't have a, a good chronology yet for the, uh, for the Siderian events. Uh, the one, the glaciation um, that's in South Africa that's, uh, that's younger, that's up uh, just under the Heckport uh, volcanics at 2220 or so, um, that glaciation uh, uh, has recently been shown to be high latitude. There's a high latitude pole now um, by uh, from Sarah uh, uh, Slotsnik at uh, Caltech uh, for, for the Heckport, and so that's you know, probably a regional glaciation. So that that's my thought on the uh, on the Siderian. Oh, I, let me just add one thing. Uh, I think the ox the highly depleted oxygen isotopes. Um, from metamorphic and igneous rocks is highly prob problematic for snowball. Okay, <laughs> in snowball, I think the, uh, the the ice overall is heavy. The ocean is light, and over the course of the snowball, the ice gets heavier and heavier, and the ocean gets lighter and lighter in oxygen and ice terms. Completely backwards from uh, normal glaciations. Hmm. Interesting. And, yeah. Well, the reason is basically um, that you begin with ice water fractionation three per mil. So if, if you know, a third of the ocean becomes ice, the ice will be plus two per mil and the ocean will be minus one per mil if it starts at zero. And then there's no fractionation during sublimation because of low diffusion rate. So, but there's very strong fractionation when you make snow, 15 per mil or so because of the cold air temperature. And so there's, there's very strong um, um, uh, Rayleigh distillation. So as you get farther from sources, it gets lighter and lighter. So the centers of, of large continental ice sheets will be quite light. That gives rise to the meltwater, okay? But that ultimately feeds back to the ocean. And so that makes the ocean getting lighter and lighter and lighter all the time, and the ice is getting heavier and heavier and heavier, basically because you have this asymmetry between sublimation with little fractionation and, and, uh, and crystallization snow production, which has very strong fractionation. Well, well that's great. Um, just to say, uh, Paul, that um, uh, Juan Rodriguez has just typed to thank you for the answer about the Dolomites, and he's just complimented your talk. So um, thanks very much there. Um, there's two questions here. I might actually just combine them. Misha Rule has asked if dust and ash is redistributed over millions of years throughout the ice sheet, to what extent then do the UPB 
ages in the sedimentary record reflect depositional ages. And as a tangent to that, Mike Sims, who's uh, been watching this up in Belfast, compliments the talk, fascinating talk. If meteoric dust ends up at the equator, uh, at an equatorial ablation zone, might we expect high levels of iridium or nickel or something like that where the moulins discharged? And could these be identified? Could these points be um, be uh, uh, pin, you know, pinpointed? in terms of uh, source areas. So really questions about the dust. Does the dust and if the way it's distributed over the ice, will that influence UPB ages? And then in terms of the, the dust itself, um, would we expect a signal from that in terms of nickel or, or iridium or anything like that? And could we pinpoint sources? Yeah, yeah. So great questions, both of them. <laughs> Yeah, so of course I looked into the uh, resonance time of the dust um, in the ice and transit to the equator and then on the in the cryokinite and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I actually discussed that a bit in, in my science advances review paper in 2017. And uh, unless the, uh, you know, so for most of the uh, surface area of the Earth, uh, the entire transit time from from initial emplacement in the ice until final deposition through the moulin, taking ma making some uh, you know uh, estimate of of, uh, of, the, of the intermediate uh, residence times and the, and the de details are in the in the science advances paper. Uh, I didn't uh, you know for for the vast bulk of it, uh, the the residence times, the total residence, the combined residence times. Uh, were never more than uh, than you know hundred a few hundred thousand years, so they were fell within the the uncertainties of even idea CA ID tins uh, uranium led geochronology, so it, it does not seem to be a uh, uh, an operational issue as far as the dates the, the, the dates uh, of, of final uh, 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 sedimentation uh, are going to be pretty close uh, mm -hmm. less than a year. From the date of the from the time of eruption, um, and, and unless it, you know, for a tiny percentage it, it get you know sort of trapped somewhere, you know, has a really prolonged uh, trajectory to the uh, to the equatorial zone. Now uh, the the question, uh, the cosmogenic flux is really trivial relative to the volcanic. I mean, if it's volcanic flux, it's less than a percent. Uh, so you, you you know that that, that makes it kind of uh, hard hard to find. Um, probably the, the the best way would be to to look, uh, for example, with uh, osmium isotopes uh, to see whether it's genetic or not. And in fact, uh, Bernard Parker uh, uh, um, Ehrenbrink uh, has already done this because we wanted to test that old of the Dizilich, uh, uh finding from Zambia, and uh, so we uh, he came out to Namibia about 15 years ago now. And that paper came out around 2015, 2016 in the So we sampled the, um, where you would expect, uh, the, the, so the idea was that, uh, you know, all this cosmogenic flux built up in the ice and then it got dumped out at the time of deglaciation because they had seen a, uh, an iridium spike in, in Jokor uh, in Zambia after both glaciations, but did not report the osmium isotopes, which would have been the, the test. And it's you know, surprising they didn't do that. Because of course the osmium isotope should be very non-radiogenic, unlike the trinol. Mm. You know. And and so um, so what we didn't find any spike. We looked underneath the cap. We looked at the, at the transition from massive diamagnetite to stratified. We looked also some samples from the Kenzie Mountains. But we drilled continuous sections in Namibia. I see they were drilled. They were sawed out as wedges. And then we looked at them. You know, they looked at them meticulously. Uh, a, there's no spike, and and the osmium. Is sort of midway between, you know, radiogenic, detrital derived, and volcanic. Okay, it is not cosmogenic. Well, okay. Well, just to say, um, there's lots and lots of uh, comments coming on the the chat here on um, YouTube, Paul. A lot of people thanking you. Amazing presentation. Thanks so much. Um, and people very appreciative of the the Q and A. Um, one very, very final question, if, if we may, Paul, and Aoife Braden has actually given me the perfect question to sort of finish everything up with. And really, it's a question sort of looking to the future. If you had to pick one thing, Paul, 
the next question to be addressed with regards all of this, this the, the snowball um, earth model and also the idea of the, the, the freshwater origin. One thing, what is next on your list, your wish list or your target list of, of, of things that needs to be tested or checked or, 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 or questioned? Uh, the age of the Maranon onset. <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. The age of the Maranon onset. Yes, because you did say that the onset was pretty fuzzy. That's, so um, that's what we really need. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. What, what if it turns out to be six thirty-six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it yeah. turns out to be six thirty-six, I got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because it ended six thirty-five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We also have a problem if it if it you know if it turns out to be uh, six fifty nine. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that that so there's a lot of things hinging on that. How long the you know the interglacial was, um, how long the Maranoan was, um, how different the Maranoan was from the Sturdian, um, and uh, yeah, and so there there's a lot, lot of other records. I mean, we have these biomarker records from that. We're, we're soon going to have biomarker records from the Sturdian glacial times sediment. And, uh, yeah, so that, that's an important one. Very good, very good. That's great. No, we know now what to expect on the next uh, big publication, Paul. So um, thanks very much. I'm going to leave it at that because we've held you. you you've given such a, a brilliant talk. And, and then you've been so kind answering all of the questions. So I, I think we'll we'll leave it with the questions for, for that here and now. Brendan, I'll, I'll hand back to you to to uh, wrap, wrap things up. But thanks again, Paul. That was brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed, Paul, for that. It was uh, an amazing talk. And uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to answer all the questions. Uh, I'm sorry that we weren't able to uh, bring you out uh, to Ireland uh, so that you could finally visit yourself. But, you know, if you do ever want to go and have a look at some of our snowball earth rocks, they are much more impressive than the ones that we've looked at uh, in the, in the Port of Skeg. But, uh, uh, you know, we have some. And if you want to see them, you know, you'd be very welcome uh, when uh, the current global health crisis is a thing of the past. Uh, I'd love to go to Donegal for many reasons. <laughs> well, let, let's make it happen then. Okay, so uh, and thanks very much to everyone for attending, both in Teams and on YouTube. Uh, the talk sessions for the conference will start uh, tomorrow at 9 in the morning. Uh, you should already have the links in your email uh, about those, but uh, send me an email if uh, there are any issues with that, and I'll, I'll try and sort it out. So thanks very much again to Paul. Thanks very much for everyone for attending, and we'll see you in the talks tomorrow. Thanks, and good night. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks